Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16th to 20th. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma. And it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Robert Wright, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers include William Barber II, Anna Carter Florence, Lauren Winner, Emily and Amelia Nagoski, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany, which falls on February 13, 2022, are from Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 10, Psalm 1, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20, and Luke 6, 17 through 26, otherwise known as fondly called the Sermon on the Plain on the level place as opposed a mesa. to the mountain. Could have been a mesa. Mesa. I like that idea. Yes, the Sermon on the Plain. He came down with them and stood on the level place. Well, it's a great passage for a whole host of reasons, <laughs> mostly because it it just keeps hammering home this reversal theme and this I'm going to be in the unlikely places theme. Uh, this is where he's going to be found, similar to how the Sermon on the Mount operates in Matthew. But here you've got the blessings and the woes. So I've got a little shtick on that, which we can talk about if you want to. But I think I brought this up three years ago because roughly four years ago, I was studying lectionary texts with a group of Presbyterian pastors special shout out to the movable feast. And I forgot who it was. I have notes on this, but I think I lost them when I moved offices recently. And I remember who pointed this out, but the point was, which I think is brilliant. Why do we always assume that woe is, is the equivalent of cursed? That we've got blessings versus woes. And we sometimes take this as blessed are you, but cursed are you folks, which isn't really what woe means. Uh, woe just means woe. It has a sense of alas, and I, I would suggest that we think about even woe is me. Yeah, well, it's that's how you pronounce the Greek word is actually woe. It's mm -hmm. or whoa, um, which I wouldn't recommend for your lector. But where was I? Um, <laughs> what if it's more a sense of look out? It's that's warning as opposed to saying. You know, blessing and cursed in our, a lot of our understanding has this idea that the decision has been made, right? Sorry, you got, you got the cursed, uh, you're in the cursed door. These folks going into the blessing door. Uh, it's a one-way door. That's it. That's not a very helpful <laughs> sermon on the plane to be preached, I don't think. But there is a sense in which he's trying to say, look out. Don't you realize what kind of a path you're on, uh, the danger that comes with being uh, rich with being full or well-fed, laughing now, uh, being in a position where people speak well of you or where you're seeking out that, that type of thing. Anyway, I find that as I, more I, as I play with that in my own teaching around this passage, uh, I, I find it really helpful because we talked a lot about blessing being not necessarily, not, that blessed doesn't necessarily translate well to happy in English, although you hear that sometimes, but it has a sense of satisfied, right? Content, being on the right track, so to speak. Yeah, I, well, I think too, that one of the helpful aspects of the literary context of that, getting to what you're, what you're talking about, how do we recapture what woe means, not as a curse, but it's like, like being called to attention, is that, is that uh, the way in which Luke's Jesus is setting out this new vision of the world and uh, and 
we've we've skipped a few chapters. I don't know if you noticed that from or a few few verses between five one through eleven, and now we're at six seventeen through twenty six, and. In those chapters, Jesus has cleansed, cleansed a leper. He has healed a paralytic. Uh, we have the call of Levi, the tax collector, and, and the healing of the man with a withered hand. And then we have questions about fasting, questions about the Sabbath, healing of the man with a withered hand. And then we get to uh, this, you know, this sermon on the plane of, of of you know of this calling of of blessing the beatitudes or whatever but also these calling to attention and so uh and so it's it 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 really is a sense of uh in verse 19 all in the crowd were trying to touch him for power came out from him and healed all of them this is what they have already seen this is what they've already experienced and uh, and so it's recognizing that this that what we're hearing here from Jesus is what's already happened. Uh, we're already we're already seeing that being brought to bear. And uh, and to what extent this passage is going back to five thirty six to thirty nine. Uh, no one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it on old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn. And the piece uh, from the new will not match the old, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. And so, the sort of calling forth of a new way of of understanding who is blessed uh, and who God sees is really, really important here. I think I think the word blessed doesn't translate makarioi well, and makarioi and oi. Uh, I think that those are those are Old Testament traditions that in the Old Testament, they, uh, the, the technical biblical term is macarism, which uh, no one knows. Uh, but macaroon, these are, Mac macaroon, no. Yeah. I don't like macaroons actually. Do you like macaroons? No, I'm with you. Yeah, um, too much coconut. I like a little bit of like coconut, soap. a lot of coconut. Yeah. So there are blessing and cursing healthy. passages such as uh, at the end of Deuteronomy, um, but they don't use these words. So the word, like you said, the word woe here transliterates the Hebrew. And there's two different words, actually. One is hoy and the other is oi. Uh, and uh, oi means woe. And it's the opposite of do not be afraid. It's, it's form critical. It's you're about to get bad news. Uh, when you're about to get good news, they say, don't be afraid. So you're exactly, I mean, that that's exactly right. But blessed should not be translated blessed or happy, either one. Uh, I like respectable. Um, that is, who, who, who should you look up to? Who are the people you should be looking up to uh, if, if you've got um, a kingdom of God perspective? Uh, not the rich, you know, not the powerful. Uh, rather, you should be looking up to these other. It's, it's a very different worldview. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think that would be I think that's an important distinction that we're making in this conversation of how these are how these are heard, and uh, particularly as as the preacher does a little bit of background work in comparing the beatitudes in Matthew and then the beatitudes here, uh, that that this inclusion of for Luke of the woes, uh, what is its function, right? What is it trying to do here? It's not making a claim necessarily, um, but, but uh, of, a, of a status maybe, but it's more of like a call to attention. I like that. Yeah, it underscores the way in which so much of Jesus' ministry in this gospel is reorientation. It's to, to reshape people's perspectives on matters of the law, which we've seen in chapter five, chapter six, and we'll see later on, uh, on like this, who is blessed or who has value or who is respectable, like, who does one look up to? Also it's different economic things which we'll see, but the parables will play a big role in that as another way of reorienting people to a new way of seeing things. Uh, certain people in, in Luke seven, when the sin, so-called sinful woman shows up and Jesus says, Simon, do you see this woman? Like, how do you, what do you see her as? I mean, there's, so to help people get a sense for what's 
going on here, that Jesus does this through teaching, through action, uh, in his own self, in his own, in his own body, and the way he will, we'll talk about that when we get to the, um, the transfiguration, but also in the various kinds of teachings. So we don't just hear this as, you know, just so you all know, these are the folks I've decided to damn and the people I've decided to save, because that's not, I think, what's exactly going on here. Yeah, exactly right. And it's so upsetting, right? Why would you, why would you want to tell the rich and the well-fed and the respectable, well, socially respectable people to look out Mm -hmm. and to be warned right it's just it's what he's talking about here is is really an upside down view of uh of human community and success how we would might how we might measure that which is why well which is why again for the preacher to go back and look at what's happened before this so that there's a the context you're bringing in i mean in terms of the upside down or the reversal of fortunes that we're talking about you know the fact that the calling of levi we have the, basically the same language that we get in the calling of the disciples. He got up, left everything and followed him. And so it, it, it just opens up that, that reality. And, and I think really underscores the, the, opening verse, the opening verse of this particular pericope. He came down with them and stood in a little place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And, it's that it's that the reality of the of of putting forth a, a reign that is um, that is for all people and how well then people respond uh, and and that's that's a again a key theme that we've talked about in Epiphany as well of that revelation of 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 the the kind of vision of this new world and then the question will be well what's your response to that. I think as with any worldview, I mean, or any parable, it, it could also be twisted. I mean, one of the things I note is uh, the comparison between verse um, 22 and 26. Blessed are you when people hate you and exclude you, revile you and defame me on account of the son of man. Um, and then woe to you that uh, well, well, those, when they speak well of you for that's what their ancestors did to the false prophets. I mean, it's, it's sort of like almost saying, um, you're going to be both of these at, at certain times. And I, I do think that's a helpful way to look at the two different sets is sometimes we're going to be these, sometimes we're going to be that. Don't think just because you're going through the hard times that God isn't with you and uh, God's grace isn't uh, blossoming in your life. That's the natural thing. But also just uh, if people hate your preaching, uh, that doesn't mean uh, you're right. I mean, it'd be easy to say, oh, they hated that sermon. Boy, I must have been right. Oh, they loved that sermon. I must be wrong. You know, um, although it is or good vice to versa. Think. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So don't uh, it can be stretched. But I do think uh, overall, as you've both been pointing to very clearly, it's this it, it is the reversed values of the kingdom of, of Jesus. And I think, uh, you know, again, we are in Luke, we're back in Luke, we're going to be moving through, uh, through Luke now until, uh, obviously, till Christ the King. And so when I'm talking about Luke, I am always reminding people of you've got to have Luke 24, 11 in mind as well, that uh, the, the response to the empty tomb is the disciples thought it was an idle tale, that they thought it was nonsense, ridiculous, garbage. And uh, so that's that's this that that this rejection of the upside downness of this kingdom is inherent in this gospel and so to pay attention to that and not to think that that we are exempt from that rejection i think is key the challenge then is to explore what does this actually look like if we lived this out if we really believe this what would what would change about our our, our churches our our sense of leadership, our sense of mission, all of those yeah. things. Well, as Anna Carter Florence says about Luke 24, 11, because if the dead can't even stay dead, what is there to count on? <laughs> so something to think about. When we start off with Jeremiah 17, Rolf, can you say more about cursed and blessed there? Just so. Yes. I, thank you for asking. <laughs> so, you have Jeremiah 17 and Psalm 1 obviously picked because of the, those antitheses. 
Psalm 1 is close to what you get in Luke, because there the words are, they translated happy, but really it means respectable or um, enviable is how I translate it. But in Jeremiah 17, it's actually the words blessed and cursed. These are blessings and cursings. Um, Baruch for blessed, Arur for cursed. Uh, so I don't like the pairing at all, um, at all, uh, because this is actually talking about um, how God is going to be active. Um, however, I do like what Jeremiah says. Can I interrupt really quick? Are you saying then that in Jeremiah, like essentially the die is cast, right? People have already kind of been on their side. God has chosen what God will do. I don't think it's that. I think, but rather it is that um, God has promised how God will respond. Um, and that is God will respond. But, but notice it's, if you trust in mortals, most pro I think probably we could just translate this, by the way, men. Um, if you trust in men, whatever, uh, you know, especially in this case, uh, they're talking about men in power, kings, yep. generals, soldiers. That's what they're talking about, especially, or, or rather Isaiah is talking about, um, rather than trusting in God. Yeah, but here, the, it's not, Jeremiah consistently, he's preaching, he says, um, you can choose. It is not too late to change. It is not too late to choose God and put away. And then he's got, you know, a, a really um, rich uh, a palette of describing the people's sins. Um, but here, the obvious sin is um, idolatry, trusting and worshiping something other than the Lord. Which is, a, which is you're saying also is a connection to Psalm 1 in part. But that's the, yes, isn't it? But the, Psalm one is not. Psalm one doesn't use these verbs, blessed and cursed. No, but but that that sense of idolatry, and let me let me see what you let's see what you think about this, Ralph. That that there there is a sort. I guess the connection, one of the connections I'm making, which I think I'm making now back to Luke as well, is that uh, that uh, where where are you where are you planting your tree? <laughs> right? Where is your tree planted? Uh, where, where are you staking ground? Uh, and, and does that, does that reflect in how you go about the world? I, that's, that's a connection that I, or a theme that I'm making throughout those three passages. And part of what Jesus is saying is, is, yeah, what, what are you going to, what are you going to stake your, your ground on? Where are you going to plant your tree? With regard to um, with regard to how you see how you envision the kingdom of God, is that what do you what do you what do you both think about that? I think it's right. Uh, I'll say more about Psalm awesome. one in a minute. In that yeah. sense, um, but sticking with for uh, Jeremiah seventeen, I mean, absolutely, th this is who you're going to trust in. And by the way, I love this uh, verse. Uh, the heart is devious above all else only because um, this is February 13th. The next day is Valentine's Day. So it's oh, sort of a great wow. Valentine's Day sermon. The heart is devious above all else. This, um, my goddaughter Mari was baptized on Valentine's Day, and this was the text. And so hoo -hoo, oh, mercy. happy baptismal birthday, Mari. The heart is devious. So anything else in Psalms, uh, excuse me, Jeremiah 17? So Psalm one, though, is this is this is a macroism. Uh, the word happy, old translation, blessed. It's not Baruch. It's rather it's the analog to uh, whatever the Greek translation is. Uh, uh, the Greek word makarioi is in Luke six. That's how Asherah is translated. I'm almost sure. I'll look it up in a second in the Septuagint. And here it's not here. The interesting thing is. It's not God, God's self, like Jeremiah 17. Here, it's the word of God. Where are you going to plant yourself? It says, it's translated, bad translation, the law of the Lord. It should say Torah. This is a late psalm. Uh, scripture is a thing by now. And what it's saying is the Torah, the word, is where you should center your life. Where should you be planted? Like a tree that 
whose roots go down underneath the, and in a dry climate, get their nourishment from the stream next to which they're planted, probably irrigation ditch, uh, the word of God. And I like to think about, you know, who's that, who's that elderly person that you know or have known who is able to endure suffering? The, um, the judgment in verse five, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, really means it's not talking about the apocalyptic judgment, uh, uh, the second coming, so to speak. It's rather talking about hard times. Uh, who are, that's the person you should look up to, that, that maybe that old person um, who, you know, they, they can handle tough times. They've been through it. Um, you want to be like them? Study the word of God. Good. Can I say one other thing about the tree? Sure. sure. Uh, my, my godfather, seeking, uh, this is apparently my, my theme for this podcast, uh, recently died. And he says the Psalms start with a picture, the book of Psalms. And uh, it's the picture of a tree. And so that's a, that's a fun thing to think about with groups is picture, you know, close your eyes, you read the verse and said, what tree do you picture? And it'll be a whole range of trees. There's no right answer that we're not doing a historical criticism here. Uh, we're doing poetry, but I think there is the tree. And now you guys are both Northern California people. So I already, yeah, you got orange trees and redwoods or orange trees or maybe Southern California, but um, no, I had, here. We, I had two orange trees and a tangerine tree in the back of my, in my backyard in the Bay area. Oh, so there you go. Yeah. But I think it's a fun thing for people to, like uh, that. that invites people. Uh, almost everybody knows what trees are and, and are, they uh, maybe have a tree, a favorite tree. And why is that a great image for someone who is strong in the faith? Mm. I like that. Back to first. Let's Corinthians. go on to the, the greatest chapter in the Bible, in my humble opinion. Uh First Corinthians 15, as I think I've told you guys before, I loved Paul and first Corinthians 15 so much that I went to the Old Testament. <laughs> well, it's a good commentary from, from Frank Crouch online if you want to uh, mm -hmm. get some help kind of tracking the, the rhetoric mm -hmm. to see what Paul is talking about. And how this is a passage where Paul's rhetoric will get really confusing in a hurry beyond this passage. He'll start talking about fish and birds and stuff like that. But at least for now, it's a little bit easier to track. But it's uh, it's I think it's really important that that Frank talks about how this is not Paul arguing people yeah. into believing in the resurrection. This is not right. a proof. This is not a way of saying if people don't believe well enough, you just need to argue with them more. It's it's. Uh, Paul recognizes what a strange thing this is to argue for, even though he is at the same time um, being very insistent about the importance of the resurrection for Christian faith. So I would, I would highlight that as one thing. Uh, and I would also, I think it's really good when you preach on the resurrection, which is obviously usually an Easter season, but here's a chance to talk about it without the, the the colors and the and the eggs and the flowers and the lilies all that stuff to give people permission to uh, to to have trouble with this to to have seasons where it's easier and seasons where it's harder to believe and maybe even to stretch the question out from the pulpit of is it easier or harder to believe in stuff like this now during the pandemic and i, I imagine you get different answers depending upon who you speak to and how suffering has played itself out in people's lives and how disappointment and hope have played themselves out. But yeah. I, I please don't preach this text as you would have three years ago, I guess is what I'm trying to say, but take into account um, how, how our circumstances have affected people's ability, ability is the wrong word, people's inclination to be able to um, confess resurrection faith or not. Yeah, I made a note when I was preparing for our podcast today, Matt, I made a note of what difference does that, what difference does it make or should it make to hear this passage in Lent and the promise of the resurrection in Lent and to what extent it's exactly the contextual reality <laughs> in which we find ourselves. I said um, to say this because you both are Lutheran, you know, it's not Lent yet, right? It's Epiphany. Oh, Epiphany. Sorry. 
Yes. Sorry, I know you both get excited that. as soon as Christmas I meant, ends for Lent. Sorry, I meant sorry, I meant to say Epiphany. Yeah. What does right. it mean? What does it mean to uh, to hear this passage not in Easter, as you said, uh, and in in this time of of what's of what's being revealed? And I think that's really I think that's really significant. And I also would call attention to the last paragraph in the commentary. It's not possible possible to proclaim that there is no resurrection of the dead once we have seen resurrection made visible in people whose actions bear witness to God's life-giving power. And that uh, we don't have to make ourselves believe it. It speaks for itself all around us and among us from creation to Exodus to prophets to Jesus until now and forever. And I think that's the kind of space and uh, space that a sermon on this passage could, could provide and invite this Sunday.